Greetings one and all, hope you're enjoying the summer. I have been, I love the summer, it's my favourite time of year. I know we're not supposed to have favourites, but I just love summer. I love the sun, I love being out in it. And I like being warm, which is why I kind of I don't get on very well with winter. I do despise being cold, though I know someone's going to put, love what you hate, which is true, you know, I should learn to love winter, learn to love money and maybe it'll come my way. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to do a little bit about Gurdjieff and read from the All and Everything book and do a little discussion on it because I've had a few comments on various videos uh, lately, not recent ones. It's weird. Someone, someone started watching one of my old ones, started a comment thread, and that's brought other people in about whether heaven and hell exist. And, you know, they say, oh, Gurdjieff says there is no heaven or hell. And he kind of, that person is right. I don't know if it's a he or she, because it's a, a, like a pen name, pseudonym or whatever. It's not a real name. But, you know, I appreciate all comments. And it challenges me to look into things deeper, let's say, or have another look at things and try and uh, obviously fathom the gist, which is what Gurdjieff's inspiring us all to do with his work. So thank you for them comments. It had, had made me look at other things. And other comments were put on recently, so I'm going to do other shows on other things that have been uh, mentioned. So I wanted to do about heaven and hell. And from all and everything, go just Beelzebub's towels, I was going to do a little bit from the Holy Planet Purgatory chapter, which I'm pretty sure I've recorded and put up on this channel. If not, it's definitely on Internet Archive. So Beelzebub's talking as usual, to his grandson, Hussein. But this is towards the end of this, this chapter and the end of the second book of Beelzebub's Towers because it's written in three books. But, but this is all three books in one. You, I know you can buy them individually, book one, book two, book three, and such like. But anyway, right, let's get going. So Beelzebub's talking to Hussein. The confusion of the minds of the initiated beings of the planet Earth of that time occurred, in my opinion, chiefly because of that beautiful theory of the Babylonian dualists, in which it was said that in some other world, as it were, paradise and hell exist. So Gurdjieff's putting it down here that paradise and hell is coming from the Babylonian myth. So he's not saying there's a heaven or hell. He's saying this is what the Babylonians believed in and this is what started causing the problems and I can see how that's happened over history and over time we've got a uh, you know uh, people that believe that all sinners all those that do injustices in this world they're going to get their retribution by ending up in hell and I wonder if that stops some people following through with justice not just because perhaps they're scared of people doing bad things to them that they don't uh, seek retribution for what's happened to them, not necessarily vengeance or anything, but perhaps because they think, well, they'll get their just come out, up, come out, oh, just. <laughs> they will get what they deserve, is what I'm trying to say, when they die. And obviously, over the years, people are arguing, well, not everyone's a believer in heaven and hell. You know, all these uh, people that believe in, you know, we just live this life, and when it's over, people just disappear, die wiped out of existence so there is no divine justice that's what people are looking for in this realm in this world which is why they thought about heaven and hell you know the righteous will return to the gods and all the sinners will go down to hell to be with the dark forces and you know that all comes down to the matters of even if you do little sins does that mean you'll not get to heaven if you're a knowing sinner, maybe you don't get to heaven because you know what you're doing is wrong, so you'll be sent straight down to hell. Surely there's no perfect people out there that have never sinned. I'm sure there's good people out there, but do they still have faults in their minds of, you know, someone does something awful to them, so the only way they can, because they're good people and they don't want to uh, have a fight or cause vengeance or something like that instead they just think awful things about someone you know does that count does that stop you getting into hell what you think or is it just what you do in this life 
uh, stops you getting into heaven rather. What justifies who goes where in heaven and hell? Well, it's not something I can decide, obviously, and it's not something you can decide. This is all if, if heaven and hell does exist. It's when you get to them pearly gates of heaven. I think it's Peter or is it Paul is there waiting to decide whether or not to let us in or if we go down to hell. And maybe, well, I, I can see how this probably comforts a lot of people because they're looking for justice in this world one of the problems with tv and movies today the good guys the white hats always win don't they at the end it might be a struggle but they get their justice and you know the baddies are put in prison or killed or whatever or perhaps even the baddies are turned around so they can suddenly see what they were doing was wrong so they find the light you know a bit of like spoiler alert darth vader in the first three episodes well i think they're four five six now and Darth Vader changes to recognise what he was doing was wrong and became the good guy. Many people on their deathbeds <laughs> convert to Catholicism, get the forgiveness and believe they're going to, to heaven to join God. But who knows? You know, we, we don't know unless we've died and gone to heaven or hell. We don't know in this life, but still... What are we doing with our lives? Are, should we be thinking of what we do in this life will have an effect on our afterlife, whether we'll go to heaven or hell? Obviously, Gurdjieff talks a lot about reincarnation or whether you develop your Christian body and move on. But for many other people that don't follow the Gurdjieff work, maybe this is a good way for them to think about what they're doing in this life and how they're reacting. Or acting, if they're lucky. Um, you know, what are the implications of their actions? Are they doing things because they want to get to heaven or are they doing things because they have no concern for anything else and think, you know, no moral judgments and don't maybe even believe in heaven and hell. So don't know that they might end up in hell. Who knows? But then Gurdjieff saying here that the confusion, as I've just spouted a load of confusion about what heaven and hell are, was all because of this opinion of heaven and hell, paradise and hell, he calls here. So he says, just these same two expressions, namely paradise and hell, served, in my opinion, as the cause of all the subsequent twaddle. The point is that in one of the legumanisms about the holy planet purgatory, both of these words, paradise and hell, were also used. So he's been talking about what the planet purgatory is. That's what this chapter is all about, why people go to the holy planet purgatory. And I will come back to that in another show. And I've done a show about that with Josh, so I shall try and remember to put the link to that. I do not know whether these two words were taken from the legomanism concerning the holy planet or whether they were obtained by a chance coincidence. By these same two words, we're talk, still talking about heaven and or paradise and hell, he's calling it here. By these same two words, the two following conceptions were expressed in the legomanism about the holy planet purgatory. By the word paradise, the magnificent, magnificence and richness which are on that holy planet were defined. And by the word hell, that inner state indeed experienced by the higher being bodies who dwell there, and namely the state of constant anguish, grief and oppression. So, you know, like <laughs> hell is going to be a bit like earth anyway. We all have to go through states of anguish, grief and, and you know, oppression, depression. You know, life is not easy, is it? We, we face these kinds of things all the time. And I've had many people say to me, this is hell. And I used to go through that phase as well. I, I did wonder if maybe he Earth is the hell realm. Now I'm kind of more of a, I think it's a testing realm to develop yourself. You know, and it's how we live on this planet will help I was going to say the hierarchy of the angels up to the divine source to decide where we go on the next, after our death, where we're going next. So what we're doing on this life has a means, even though many people feel that life has no meaning. I've, I've been through that phase myself as well. I often have been. I'm, actually, I did the, just the other day when I was, I was away for a few days. 
no TV, no nothing, just wandering around the countryside. And then it got to a certain point in the afternoon. It's like, is this, am I wasting my time? Even though obviously I wasn't, I was enjoying myself out in the countryside. But it's like, well, what is the meaning? What should I be doing? Maybe life has no meaning. So I spent an afternoon thinking about all that when I was also trying to be at one with nature in the countryside. <laughs> But we're not told, are we? You know, when we're when we're born as babies, obviously we're still babies and don't understand language or anything, so we can't be told what life's all about. We learn about life as we grow up from our peers and the movies and the TV shows and whatever that programs us to think that life's going to be a certain way. And then as we start to change, people like us that do the Gurdjieff work or some spiritual path suddenly are aware of, no, there's something more going on here. <laughs> there's something I can't quite grasp it but I know that life has a much more meaning and that to work to get to that we need to work on ourselves to develop who we really are so that we can see what life really is and what it offers us and when I was saying about the bit of being in the countryside and suddenly going oh what is life all about I know that on my walk, I was beginning to think about life's problems or what am I doing for the future and things like that. So then thoughts were then working in my mind. <laughs> and after a while, you know, they, they've all caught up with each other and gone, oh, what is life about? It has no meaning. And it was like, um, <laughs> like, you know, the devil's in your head going, there's no point to anything. But I had to bring myself back out of that and think, no, there is a point to something. I have my mission. I have my aims. I have what you know, Gurdjieff talks about of working upon myself. And my aims are to develop myself to the best of my ability so that I can be as waking up and hopefully as awake as possible. Whether I'll reach that, who knows? But <laughs> I think what Gurdjieff's saying here about paradise and hell is that people use that as an as, uh, an excuse not to have to work on themselves because they just think well when you die it depends on what you've done in life it doesn't matter anyway you're either going to heaven or hell well we're doing it's like it's taken away the whole idea of working for yourself and developing yourself i've actually had um quite a few other comments recently about know thyself and uh, a bit of a thread going on on one of the shows i can't remember which one it was now but I do strongly believe that we do need to learn to know ourselves. You know, like I was saying about that walk in the country where I was starting to think, well, what is life all about? You know, I've had that before. It's not the first time. And I always <laughs> thankfully be able to drag myself out of that kind of thinking. But that was me having to learn, look at myself again and get to know myself. Well, well why did I get to that kind of state of thinking? What was going on to, to take me to that? What was the progressive path that led to that sudden I was going to say exclamation then, but I suppose it was a bit of an exclamation because I do remember stopping dead in my tracks of the countryside going, why is life no meaning? <laughs> but if I can backtrack and look at it and then know where I'm coming from, it helps me to understand myself rather than letting them thoughts drag me down and keep me down. Or hide behind ideas such as paradise and hell which is what I believe Gurdjieff is coming to here he likes to use the word that this is all twaddle <laughs> maybe I'm talking twaddle right, I'm going to carry on and also yes I'm just going to suddenly because I was, he was saying about how the, on this earth it's anguish grief and depression you know I think many people are hoping that they're going to go to heaven because they just want peace after all the anguish the grief and the oppression that's been going on in their life that they've been living on this planet Earth, you know, it's kind of like they just want to rest, rest from it all. So they're thinking, oh, I'm going to go to heaven where, you know, the angels are playing their harps and we all sit around peacefully and serenely, which I think would be fantastic, wouldn't it? That'd be just such an experience. But whether it's true or not, I do not know. Anyway, Gurdjieff says, and in one of the legomenisms, I'm having trouble with that word today. And in one of the legomenisms, the causes for this state of theirs was even explained in detail. That is, that these higher being parts or souls have ultimately fallen after inexpressible 
consciously suffering labors onto this holy planet. And having seen and understood the reality and significance of everything existing, and chiefly seeing our common father endlessness himself so near and so often, they have become aware that on account of the undesirable elements present in them, they are still unable to help him, the divine source, in the fulfillment of his, the divine source, most sacred task for the good of our whole megalocosmos. And I'm going to go back to my, uh, well, it wasn't an analogy, it's a true story of my little moment in the countryside of, you know, what is life all about? And I was feeling myself going a bit downhill a bit. That was not helping his endlessness. That was not helping with the continuation of the universe and uh, such like. But I did, obviously, I, I do pray. And I was praying for help. And, you know, it came to me and I had a clearing in my head. And at the same time, I know I was working on myself. It wasn't a sudden you know like an angel appeared and told me the answers by working on myself i changed that attitude i changed them energies and vibrations within me and got back onto the idea of i am here to do my divine task my or my mission to help the divine which I, i'm calling a divine task rather than a mundane materialistic secular nobody cares about god kind of task where they just live for themselves i'm here to work for his endlessness and the divine source, whatever that that is. We don't always know what our missions are, but I wanted to get attuned again. I didn't want to be dragging myself down into negative thoughts of anger, oppression, and grief. <laughs> I wanted to do the higher vibrations, which takes us to our higher selves. And Gurdjieff goes on and so, those two words then evidently were just the causes why the poor and mischievous at that time when infected by the general psychosis, imagined that the same things were talked of in that fantastic, beautiful theory of the Babylonian future as nas masses, but only in great detail. And they began half consciously to insert certain details of this fantastic theory into the legomenisms concerning the holy planet. And afterwards, these informations passing from generation to generation blossomed out with the additions of these fancies, which again, our dear Mulan Asir Adin expresses by the one word, really, Kamil Kanatoni Ashamaraka. So if anyone knows how to translate that word, please leave it in the comments. <laughs> but I'm sure that here, Mulan Asir Adin kind of expressing that. Uh, where people are adding, you know, the old Chinese whispers to what myths are about or what's going on in life, adding myths to what paradise and hell is and how to get there, how all these religions and uh, ideologies of, of religions and how one moves forward so that one reaches heaven or goes down to hell. You know, these mythologies, their expressions are changed over time and added to, and then it all just becomes, as Gurdjieff saying here, twaddle. You know, the, as time goes on, everything gets further and further away from its initial original truth of whatever it was meant to be telling us or teaching us or showing us. You know, as, uh, <laughs> we're living in a, in a world where historians and academics all feel like we have the answers we don't have the answers to the past because everything's been um well obviously lost in each we still have the ancient wisdom but it's coming to us in fragments which is why we're trying to pierce all this kind of thing back together we don't really understand humanity's history but we have myths and legends of stories from different cultures and civilizations that if we look into them we can start seeing oh there's um connections here you know like the flood myth is in nearly every culture that i can think of at the moment and comes from every continent so but over time obviously that story's changed you know in the bible it's noah in the babylonian myths is it or the sumerian myths it's just i might have said that wrong anyway i know how to spell it you know the but again, it's a slightly different story to the Noah story and so on. You can find them everywhere. So over time, <laughs> things are... The original true meaning has been meddled with 
ridiculed, well, maybe ridiculed. Yeah, probably ridiculed by people that don't believe in that kind of thing. And then change. So I've got the doors open because it's really hot. That's the neighbor's phone. They must have all their windows open. We'll just ignore it. So information is changing over time. According to what I've just told you, my boy, you can in general judge what kind of understandings and representations they have at the present time there on your planet about the what are called questions of the beyond, which was something that I've been on many different groups and read many different books. And I'm still I would like to go to places that talk about the questions of the beyond, not necessarily the afterlife, but what's beyond this life. And I still know people that go to seances. I used to go to seances. We used to hope to get the answers from the beyond. And what else did we used to do? Um, mediumship and things like that. I, I'm, I'm not into any of that now. I'm pretty, from, from my point of view, I'm not sure if it's real. It's really our ancestors or our, you know, people that are dead coming through them. I don't know. I really, uh, I'm not going to give a, an answer to that. But this is what Gertrude is saying. Everything then became because people wanted to know, which is good to query things. And normally people on the spiritual or uh, esoteric path normally have come to it because they're beginning to ask about questions that are beyond uh, this life, this earth. And let me just pause this a moment I've had to shut the door because my neighbour's decided to talk from her window um, so it's going to get very hot in here but um, so, so yeah it, I think it's good to look into the paranormal or what's beyond the world this earth because who, you know, but just don't dabble too much in it and don't go calling up demons and things because <laughs> don't do anything dark forces, but do your research. You know, it's all interesting stuff. But as Gurdjieff says, it, a lot of it is twaddle that's out there. And I've definitely found that with um, a lot of the new age stuff has become very, what in my mind is very fluffy and what I would call twaddle. It doesn't go deep enough into the esoteric. It's just a quick fix of, you know, Here's some feathers and have some smudging and say a few magical words and everything's fixed. I think it's a, though for some people, maybe it's all down to a mindset and that does work for them. But I think we need to look at deeper things. And this is what Gurdjieff's trying to encourage us to do, to look at ourselves, who we are, look at our dark sides and our light side, you know, our shadow side, as you would call it. And don't get caught up in too many conspiracies or too much twaddle as we're working on ourselves we should begin to be able to sense what is truth or what rings true to us when we do our research or work upon ourselves but i also know from meeting certain people especially in the last few years who've only just begun to research into all this they're so eager to know everything but they easily fall down rabbit holes that are not necessary or will take them down paths that are going to lead them to nowhere, which is why I'm trying to help people to, you know, by doing these shows and perhaps talk to people one-to-ones of becoming aware of yourself then helps you to become aware of what's going on out there. Now, before I go into any more twaddle, I shall just continue with what Gurdjieff says. According to what I've just told you, my boy, you can in general judge what kind of understandings and representations they have at the present time there on your planet about the what are called questions of the beyond. It can truly be said that if these understandings and notions of your eccentrics about their questions of the beyond were heard by our hens, hens, chickens, cluck, 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 they would begin to laugh so loud and so hard that the same thing might happen to them from their laughter as happens there among your favourites from what is called castor oil. For a better sensing and cognising, and at the same time for a better fairy-like illumination of the meanings of these expressions which I just use, hen's laughter and castor oil, I must tell you about some other consequences which flowed from always the same cunning, wise acorn 
of these favourites of yours. In this case, concerning the questions of the being exohari. The more so since the knowledge about this will give you additional data for elucidating by a concrete example certain particularities, which I have already explained to you, of the fundamental cosmic sacred law of Hetzaparapashinok. Now, I'm not going to go into being exohari here, but I do believe that the Hetzaparapashinok law of seven is very important to be discussing. And let me just quickly change books because law of three and law of seven in the Gurdjieff work, if we can <laughs> come to an understanding of it, we then can understand how this world works and how this universe works. And I know I've been talking a lot with people about Nikola Tesla's 369. Numbers are very important. I'm not I'm <laughs> rubbish at maths at, at school. I could do my adding and my subtracting, but I just, you know, all the higher stuff like the geometry and stuff, I found quite difficult. But I do see that there is an importance of understanding sacred geometry and how numbers work in laws. So with law of seven, He's saying, and triamazicano, calmno, which is law of three. Try very hard to understand everything that will relate to both these fundamental cosmic sacred laws. Since knowledge of these laws, particularly knowledge relating to the particularities of the sacred Heptaparapashanok, will help you in the future to understand very easily and very well all the second grade and third grade laws of world creation world existence and those of you that know about the laws of the different planets you know so we start off with the sun absolute it's lovely sun absolute where his divine source the divine source his endlessness lives it's like the heaven well that place where the divine lives we we can't understand how that works because it's well we can understand how it works but we our planet's not like that that sun absolute runs on very few laws. I, I believe it's only three laws. I forgot to bring the chart with me. I was planning to bring the chart that Ospensky did about them. So it doesn't have the, all the problems that our planet has because our planet is further down the line. <laughs> We're quite far away from the, you know, the less laws, the more heavenly, let's say for a better word, more like paradise it is. And the, the more and more, laws then it becomes more and more materialistic denser and you know more like hell let's say and I, I think earth is 96 laws but by working on ourselves we can and developing ourselves properly we can lessen the amount of laws that affect us on this planet on this in our life which is another reason to work on yourself <laughs> so you don't get caught up in law of accident and all the other laws. Um, but that shouldn't be the only reason you need to do it because you want to do it and you want to be part of uh, the divine plan and workings, as I was saying earlier. But it is important to understand these, these laws. And he reminds us that, uh, where is it? So all these laws are affecting each other. The more, the more uh, further away planets are from the sun absolute. And I've lost where my so, and we can while we're developing ourselves, we can become involved with the common cosmic sacred Hector Parapashinok. You know, we can be become working with that law. Let me find that. So we're still talking Holy Planet Purgatory chapter here. And he reminds us, now, my boy, as for the processes themselves of the transformation in the evolutionary and the involutionary movements of all these cosmic substances, so stuff coming from the divine source and the way we develop it in ourselves and send it back up again, now, my boy, as for the processes themselves of the transformation in the evolutionary and involutionary movements of all these cosmic substances, 
by means of just such apparatuses of the most great common cosmic trogo auto ego crats so that's working upon ourselves as all your favorites also are then are then those transformations proceed in them as well as in us and in general in all large and small cosmoses of our common megalocosmos strictly according to these two same chief fundamental cosmic laws namely according to the sacred heptapara pashinok and the sacred triamazi kamno so these laws are working throughout the universe but doing working upon ourselves doing the auto trogo i always forget how to say it the trogo the trogo auto ego crat work you know know thyself and uh put put yourself forward to be doing the work of bringing your centers aligned so that then you can come out of well not come out but, but be aware of what your lower self is doing and try and connect with your higher self this is all working in the laws of triamasi kamno law of three and try um, and sacred hepta para passionok law of seven and this is what we should be working towards number seven is a sacred number and three is a magic number i feel like i've been speaking loads of twaddle i think i'm gonna leave it there but thank you very much for watching and as i was saying earlier i love your comments it encourages me to do shows on other things to try and make sure i understand the gurdjieff work to the best of my ability and as always i ask people to remember to read all and everything it's my copy it was bob Towerski's grandson and You've got to remember that this is the an objectively impartial criticism of the life of man and women. We have to be critical of ourselves. We need to become impartial in what we're doing, who we are, be impartial of ourselves and how we are in the outside world. But we do need to know thyself.